like maybe now the name propagation makes more sense. This is how the chain reaction is propagating. Maybe we understand initiation as well. Notice that you only have to do one initiation step, and then you can do billions of propagation steps. You can just do one or a few initiation steps, and that will allow you to repeat this cycle of propagation billions of times, basically. So this is going to happen way more often than this happens, which is, makes sense because this was the hard step. This is the step that takes the energy. These steps don't take much energy because they both start with a radical and end with a radical. Start with a radical and end with a radical. By the way, this is a good rule of thumb for distinguishing between initiation and propagation. Here, we, in initiation, we went from no radicals to two radicals. But in the propagation steps, we start with a radical and a non-radical and make a different radical and a non-radical. Again, we started with a radical and a non-radical, and we made a different radical and a non-radical. Those patterns aren't followed 100% of the time, but I think they'll be followed for all the reactions you're going to see on the next exam. So you see those are the, the tricks we can use to tell initiation from propagation. Um, here, the number of radicals is the same, both in the starting materials and the product, whereas here, the number of radicals is increasing. And that gives us our chain mechanism. And in a sense, we're kind of done. We've shown how to get the interesting product. We've shown how to get the interesting product. So compare the starting material to the product. What would be a good name for this reaction? Is this an addition, an elimination, or a substitution? Overall, if you compare these, are we doing an addition, addition, elimination, or substitution? Uh, substitution. That's right. What are we substituting? We're substituting. The hydrogen for the chlorine. Basically. That's right. We're removing a hydrogen in this step, and then replacing with a chlorine in this step. And then removing another hydrogen, and replacing with a chlorine. And then removing another hydrogen, and replacing, replacing with a chlorine. So this is also called a um, radical substitution reaction. It's a radical halogenation, or a radical substitution reaction, or a radical chain mechanism. One reason this is interesting is, again, this gives you something you can do on somebody with no functional groups. That should seem kind of weird. Every other reaction we've learned about so far, you have to start with a functional group. Um, this is pretty much, I think, the only thing you're going to learn that you can do with no functional groups. So this is a good test taking skill. If you're doing a predict the products problem and the starting material has no functional groups, it's pretty much got to be this radical chain halogenation, because that's the only thing you're going to learn that you can do to, to straight hydrocarbons, to straight alkenes. Again, this would have worked with either heat or light. Now, this chain reaction can't keep on going forever. When would this terminate? What would a termination look like? Well, it terminates when, notice that if a radical meets a non-radical, you just get another radical and non-radical out of that. It would terminate if two radicals met up with each other. That would just be the opposite of initiation. So there's a bunch of ways this could terminate. For example, one of the chlorines could simply meet up with another chlorine. Let's draw the product from that step. Great. You should actually draw the heads of the arrows right next to each other, just because that's the conventional way to draw it. Touching? Pretty close to touching. And this is called a termination. <laughs> if a chlorine, so most of the time, most of the time, this chlorine radical that was produced in propagation step one, two, is going to bump into another ethane. But every once in a while, this chlorine radical is going to bump into another chlorine radical. Um, and then we'll, that will kind of end that, that chain reaction there. However, if you think about it, those are not the only two radicals around. For example, this chlorine could bump into an ethyl radical, because in the mix, there's also ethyl radicals. See if you can draw in the arrows and the products for how these two would react. It's pretty similar to the other termination step. Another termination step. Thinking back a little, after we did propagation step one, 
I ask you to take a guess. What do you think this ethyl radical is going to do? And your guess was that the ethyl radical would react with one of these chlorine radicals. Uh, that didn't turn out to be what happens in propagation step two, but it does sometimes happen. It's just not very interesting because it just terminates the chain. So you were right when you guessed that this could react with an unreactive chlorine radical, but that's not as interesting as the propagation step because that would just terminate the chain yeah. down here. And uh, that would be the end of the line. Now, there is one other pattern of a way that two radicals can meet up with each other here. What's, we could have a chlorine and a radical and a chlorine radical and a chlorine radical and an ethyl radical. What's the other pattern that we could have for a termination step? I guess you could have an ethyl and an ethyl. That's right, yeah, that's right. Might seem a little weird, but yeah. Um, remember that, I, I shouldn't have said before that this initiation step only happens once. I should have said the initiation step is gonna happen uh, a small number of times, and then that's gonna fuel many propagation steps. So at any point in time, there's going to be more than one ethyl radical floating around in the solution. There'll be more than one ethyl radical floating around in the solution. So every once in a while, one of the ethyl radical, usually the ethyl radical will bump into a chlorine before it bumps into another ethyl radical. But every once in a while, the two ethyl radicals will bump into each other, and then we can do a step like this. Do you not need heat or light to do propagation step two? Because it looks like that chlorine would need energy to break. You're saying that breaking this bond should be hard. What was hard? That's right. Uh, That's a very good point. But how about forming this bond? Is that hard or easy? Easy. Because we're getting rid of the radical. So the energy from forming this bond will allow us to break this okay. bond. So the, the, what's the difference here? Here we were forming two radicals and not getting rid of any radicals. Whereas here, it's true that we're forming a radical on this chlorine, but we're getting rid of the radical on the carbon. So the propagation steps fuel themselves, pretty much. The propagation steps don't need much extra help because you're just changing the place where the radical is. Um, but this is very hard because we're only doing bad things. We're only making radicals without getting rid of them. And of course, these termination steps are very easy. Um, they just don't happen very much because it's just it's unlikely that two radicals would bump into each other. But if two radicals do bump into each other, they really want to, get, to stop being radicals. So let's see if you can show the mechanism for what happened if two ethyls bump into each other. It should be similar to the steps we've already shown. some numbers here. One, two, three, four. So actually, it kind of makes sense now. To flip the position of three and four because we want right. four to be close to the number two. It doesn't matter here because in this case, this was symmetrical. But we might do another case that was not symmetrical. So it helps to be clear about who's connecting to whom. You don't have to show this bond, but I'll draw it to show that that's the bond that's being formed. So the key is that four is attaching to carbon number two. Of course, these are not IUPAC numbers, they're just labels. So in this case, there's three different possible types of termination step. Here's the three different possible types of termination. turns into two radicals, that's the initiation, and that needs energy. If a radical and a non-radical turns into a radical and a non-radical, that propagates the chain. Same for this step. And if two radicals come, come together, they make a non-radical, and that terminates the step. There are some exceptions to that, but those are the basic patterns. Initiation, propagation one, propagation two, and termination. Now again, in a sense, these termination steps are not very interesting, because the purpose of this whole reaction was just to make this product over here. And we know that we're going to get billions of these before we happen to hit a termination. So even though we're, we're going to get some of these products, it's going to happen pretty rarely. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, your instructor might simply ask you to draw the termination steps. Yeah. So even though these are not of much practical importance, it's important to be able to draw them for the exam. On the other hand, if all the instructor was asking you to do is to predict the product, you could just focus on these steps. For predicting the product, what's important is initiation, propagation one, and propagation two. 
termination is not really very important unless the instructor actually asks you for it. Um, once you've gotten here, you've actually already shown the product. All right, well, um, I don't know about you, but I think this is pretty complicated. Um, of course, every step here I think makes sense, but it, it, it's certainly hard for students to remember these steps. And uh, I certainly saw it in the, uh, in the sample exams, there was a problem that just said something like, draw initiation, propagation, and termination steps for this halogenation. So you're expected to know uh, all these steps. 